Thank you. Yeah, I've been, I've been to many countries, and I've picked up a few words in many of the languages. And I've been trying, ever since I've been here, I've been trying to remember how to say, I don't know how to speak French. Um, but so far, I can't remember. And I haven't been able to ask anyone. Somebody can tell me later. Um, so I'm here for the Python conference. And I know Edward because he's come to some of my conferences that I hold in Crested Butte. And so we arranged for me to come speak here. This presentation I gave in, this is the only the second time I've given this presentation. I gave it in January at Salesforce in San Francisco. And the slides are available on slideshare.net. I've made a few changes, but they're basically the same since then. So you can find them there. And uh, I think if you just look for my name and perhaps some, anyway, I think it, under my name, there's not that many presentations, so you'll be able to see them. Um, let's see. So just as an overview, I am, who am I? I'm a, I'm a languages guy. I guess I've always kind of been oriented towards languages, even though I only speak English, but I've dabbled in many computer programming languages. I am kind of, well, my goal has always been to try and move technology forward. So I began uh, with a master's degree in computer engineering, so which was all about hardware and the highest level language that I had used uh, academically was assembly language. And my feeling was always that we can do better, that we shouldn't have to do all of this work. We're using computers. Computers should do the work for us. We should have more sophisticated languages. So um, always trying to move things forward. And now I've gotten to the point where I've started asking, even though all I've done kind of is languages, as I started asking, do languages matter? And the uh, answer is, the brief answer is n not so much anymore. And I'll explain what I mean by that. It's kind of a weird thing for me to say, but that's kind of the conclusion that I've come to. Uh, look at phase two. Now that languages are not something that we have to struggle with so much anymore, uh, phase two is the better communication, the better process. And from that, we kind of got agile. How do we build things better? And phase three, which is what I want to eventually talk about, is how do we build better things? So we're building things better. Now we want to build better things. And I'll look at um, how to get and nurture better ideas, or at least that's the challenge. I don't have all the answers. I'm just kind of starting to explore that. So um, many of you might know me for having written this book, but I've also wrote I've also written um, uh, these books, Thinking in C++. I was on the C++ Standards Committee for eight years since its inception. That's where I learned a lot of what I learned about programming and uh, in, in depth. I basically treated that as more graduate school because at the standards committee, you pretty much had the smartest people in the world on C++ who would assemble. And by going there, I could talk to them and learn things from them. So that was a great experience. Uh, my very first book, notice even though what I was working on was very low level stuff, uh, I wanted to do computer interfacing with Pascal and C. So those at the time were considered high level languages for manipulating computer hardware because they weren't efficient enough. You had to do everything in assembly language in the minds of um, many folks. Uh, and then I started writing books on C++ and I wrote several of those. Uh, eventually wrote a book with uh, this fellow James Ward, friend of mine, on Flex. And from that I learned I shouldn't mess with closed source languages because pretty much as soon as we finished the book, Adobe decided that they were not going to pursue that anymore and cut off everything. Even though, see, if it had been an open source language, people still would be using it. There were a lot of good things about that. Uh, my latest endeavor is on Scala. And uh, I just finished the second edition of that. Um, kind of tuned it up and fixed a bunch of things. So now I think that's basically done. 
um, called it Atomic Scala because when we were putting it together, w this was the first book that I'd written specifically for beginners and also there's a couple more seats here for those of you who wandered in later. Um, also for people who are just learning Scala, but we wanted to make it something that actual beginners could use. And so one of the things that we did is reduce the chapters so that each one was only covering a single concept and as tiny as possible so that you get that sense of satisfaction that you get when you finish something. And so we started calling them atoms because they were so small and indivisible. And then we started calling the book Atomic Scala. And then the, um, you can see the artwork is, is from the mid-century atomic age. Um, I heard that in some of the scholar user groups, there was some fury about this. This is a reason that uh, it's good not to spend too much time in user groups, because somebody thought that if it was a t talking about atomic stuff, then it should be about concurrency and threading and stuff. Because that, and, and so there were people that were just outraged about that. Fortunately, I knew nothing about that until uh, only in hindsight did I find out about that. So, but that's the Scala community. If you're interested, you can go online to AtomicScala.com and download the first 25% to see if you like it. All right. Um, so I used to write for a lot of magazines, published a ton of articles. Uh, this is earlier versions of me. Uh, and then in um, 2009, I started working on a project to figure out. <clears throat> so I've always worked on my own. I, I did have a couple of jobs early on and decided that I didn't like jobs. And um, so I did a lot of this stuff just so that I could be independent. And then when I broke my leg in 2009, I was sitting around staring on drugs for a long time. And it occurred to me that I actually liked working with people, but I couldn't stand the structures that most organizations have because they put people at the top who, I'm sorry, um, but I think you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the people that they put at the top are not the people that you necessarily want to hang around with. And they like to tell you what to do and all those things that I don't like. So I avoided it for that period of time, for, for many years in my life. But then I started discovering that I really enjoy working with people, just not under those conditions. So I, well, the conference that Edward came to a couple of times uh, is an open spaces conference. And the way that we structure those is so that you show up and you kind of create the conference. Uh, there's, there's a minimum amount of structure. And the goal of the structure is to get people to interact with each other. And then basically that's the end of my job as conference organizer. And everybody does amazing things within that minimal structure. And people started coming to me and saying during some of the discussions that they would like to work for a company that worked like the conference. And that got me thinking. And so eventually, I began researching this stuff, which you can find. This is a blog, um, which you can find. And in the last oh, six or eight months, I discovered a book called Reinventing Organizations, but, uh, surprisingly similar to, to my own title here, um, by a Belgian named Frederick Lalou. And, uh, it went further than I was able to imagine to a place that I am now very interested in trying to occupy. So he created the idea of what is, well, he didn't, he didn't create the idea. He just named it. And he refers to these new kinds of organizations as teal organizations. And he has about a dozen of them that he gives as case studies in his book, which is also called Reinventing Organizations. So that's where I'm headed now. Um, my, uh, my why, so there's a, there's a fellow who talks about start with why, figure out what it is that motivates you, which is a trickier proposition than you imagine. Um, and I'm still working on it. But the closest I've gotten so far is that work is joy. And I don't mean taking the existing structure and tweaking it a little to make it joyful. I mean changing the whole organization so that being at work is joyful. So let's look at my
thesis question here for this part, which is, do languages matter? And it's really, do they still matter? Because, of course, at the beginning, when I started doing this, they mattered a lot. And that's mostly what we, org we, we argued about, uh, was, do, do they matter? And do they still matter? Do they still matter as much? Or maybe a better question is, does arguing about languages still matter? Because at one point it did. People obviously still do it a lot. But I'm thinking that maybe it doesn't matter so much anymore. I'm not as interested in arguing about them. So my experience has been this curve here, which is st at the beginning, I was going from assembly language to C. And moving from assembly to C was definitely in the steep part of the curve. You got a lot of benefit because the C compiler was doing a lot of work for you. And when I began with it, this was before ANSI C, C compiler wasn't doing so much for you, wasn't doing a lot of type checking and things like that. But it was still doing a great deal. It was generating code that otherwise you would have to have written by hand. Then, in my world, we went from C to C++, which causes backwards effects on C. So ANSI C came along and they did things like type checking of function arguments and stuff that many of you never even had to experience the bad old way of doing things. Um, so still big benefits. Now with C++ we're able to, to move a little bit more into conceptual thinking about what we're doing rather than Really, what C is, is a high-level assembly language. It's a portable assembly language. It does some work for you, but its real goal was to be able to write code. Well, those of you in the Java world know that the write once, run everywhere idea. Uh, actually, that started with C, and they were, that's what they were trying to do. And they were able to do it, portable operating systems and things like that. It, was, it, had, a, it had the same kind of problems that Java does with the write once, run everywhere, not quite working. In the case of C, it had to do with word sizes and boundaries and things like that. So anyway, now we're able to think about, begin to think about classes and generics and stuff like that. And then we move to Java, and the big steps here were the idea of virtual machines and garbage collection. Both of these ideas before Java were considered laughable. There had been some experiments, but they were so inefficient that everybody said, well, you know, those are interesting ideas, but we have to program in C or C++ because of efficiency. And Java basically proved that virtual machines and garbage collection were feasible. Now, you could argue that it did a bunch of other things, but primarily, this is, these are the two big steps forward that we had. Um, C++ had introduced exception handling and classes and things like that in a different form, perhaps, but it's uh, this... I would argue, is, is where we move forward in a big way. Um, then we began the argument about static, statically typed versus dynamic languages. Uh, I would uh, checked exceptions. OK, notice that checked exceptions only appear in Java. Nobody else has duplicated that experiment. Um, I have argued that, well, they haven't really worked out so well. Uh, problems with concurrency and parallelism. I have spent years immersed in this, and every time I do it, I usually learn something dramatic that I thought I understood before. And I mean, I'm, I'm spending, say, months at a time working on one chapter trying to figure out, you know, how is threading working, or how does, how does this work, or how does that work. And I keep finding fundamental things that, in fact, I just read a chapter in a, it's a book called, I think it was called Python for Hackers, and just came across this chapter last night. And uh, the guy had fundamental misunderstandings about what was going on here. But it was only a few years ago that I came across this. So concurrency and parallelism, we kind of equate the two topics, or at least I did for the longest time, and then I came across something where they said, well, okay, these are different ideas. Parallelism is what it sounds like. You're actually running things in parallel. Um, Concurrency is this idea that, well, something might require you to wait so you can have other things that are running, quote, at the same time or that you can jump to, but actually it doesn't have to be running in parallel. So the two are, are, are kind of separate concepts. And to understand that they're separate concepts, 
well, it's a big step. Um, and on and on we go. And now, of course, there's uh, a lot of the event-driven stuff that TypeSafe has been pushing with the, their reactive manifesto. Okay, well, that's another different way of looking at how do we deal with the issue of tons of things happening at the same time, what do we do? That's, that's the basic idea. Anyway, different languages handle this in different ways. Uh, there's object-oriented versus functional, and we have languages like Scala, which is an object-functional hybrid, and Python, which also hybridizes the two, but it doesn't make such a big deal of it. Uh, it's, it's always kind of been that way. Um, so here's an indicator. The Java Posse Roundup, which is a conference. Oh, I'm, I'm wearing the, uh, I, I'm sorry I didn't change this. This is the advertisement for what the Java Posse Roundup turned into. So we're now calling it the Winter Tech Forum. So it's more general. But one of the things that happened is that this conference, which I've organized for, I don't know how many times we did it, eight or nine times, um, we stopped talking about Java and started talking about other things, usually stuff on the Java virtual machine, but not necessarily. There were no rules about that. But the fact that people stopped talking about Java, well, that, I think that was an indication that uh, things had changed. So, um, Some of the things that happened throughout all this, for example, when Strewstrip was creating C++, his, design, his goal was to make library use easier. But because with C, library use was actually really difficult. I remember because I tried to, to use somebody's library and they said, well, you know, here's how you have to allocate the memory and then you have to free it when you're done and, and there's these other rules you have to follow. And it was really confusing and not simple to use. Uh, third-party C library, so tended just to use whatever came with the uh, package with ANSI C uh, if, if by the time that was there. Uh, let's see, talked about Java kind of moved more in this direction. It mainstreamed the idea of the big framework. C++ using a big framework was, uh, uh, it's kind of a specialized thing to do. With Java, we started seeing more of that. Uh, I would argue that Java invalidated the idea of checked exceptions. It was an experiment that they did, and I think we can we can argue that it's in, invalid. Ruby on Rails, there's a even though Python tried, Ruby on Rails is the thing that really pushed it forward because there were a lot of people who would just say, "Well, dynamic languages are fine for things like writing Perl scripts or whatever, but you know you can't do anything big in it." People tried to do big things with Perl, but it became unmanageable pretty quickly. And but when Perl six comes along, all that will change. That's supposed to be a joke. Only a couple of you smiled at that. Okay, well, dating myself, I guess. When when was Perl six announced? Was that about ten years ago? Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's the anniversary. Anyway. Um, so anyway. Because that's happened, I think we've seen a lot more movement forward because before that, people said, well, statically typed languages, that's the only way you can you know, write reasonable grown-up programs. And then Python and some of these other languages keep creating things that are bigger than anybody can imagine. They keep creating new and better things. And so that boundary keeps getting pushed back. Um, functional languages actually have been around for a long time. Lisp was one of the first languages, uh, functional language. Um, now they're being more heavily motivated by the multiple cores that we have on kind of every machine and the need for parallelism. So that's a problem that hasn't really been solved yet to the point where it works for everybody. There are languages like Go where they're trying to make it so simple and they're using the communicating sequential processes model, which basically says, okay, you're going to be a parallel system. We'll give you your, whole, your own walled garden and you can do whatever you want with that. You get your own processor. Maybe it's part of the time, but as far as you're concerned, you got your own processor. If you want to communicate with another process, you send a message over the wall and we'll make sure that there's no problem. 
but there are no shared resources. That's, and so communicating sequential processes from a programming standpoint is ideal, and that's, that's sort of what Go is, is going after. And you can imagine if you were teaching somebody Go, you'd be able to, you know, from, from start, you'd be able to have them writing parallel programs pretty quickly without having to explain a lot of stuff. Um, but the idea of the functional language is that, well, not the idea, but one of the benefits of functional languages is that it's a lot easier to write parallel programs. Um, and then we're starting to see these object functional hybrids like Scala, although it's hard to say. I'm, I'm kind of of the mind that Scala may be only, it, it was intended to, to kind of take over the Java world. I think it will be something, it will be somewhere in a niche where it's almost Strustrup's original vision, where he said, okay, we're going to have the library users here, and then the library creators have to be like 10 times smarter than everybody else because they have to learn to use all of these complicated features in C++ in order to create good libraries. Now, with Scala, we've kind of created that wall in language terms. So library creators of certain types of libraries will do them in Scala and then give them to Java programmers to consume. From the Java programmer standpoint, it'll just look like some other Java library to them. But it'll be easier for the Scala programmers to create and maintain them. Anyway, we'll see all that stuff as it happens. But my ultimate point is that it's not that big of a deal anymore to change languages. It used to be something that people would have these huge arguments about and the company had to be all using a single language. And there's still, still people who benefit from, from that kind of thing. There is a, I'm um, trying to remember the name of this organization in Denver, and they're all Ruby on Rails. And um, it's a co-working space, and it's got a training thing where you go through like six months of intensive training, at least six months of immersion, and you can start from nothing, and you come out and you, you know, know lots of stuff about Ruby on Rails, and the co-working space, everybody there is working on that, so if you get stuck, you talk to them, and uh, you can get answers pretty quickly, so you can kind of see the benefits from that, but I have always felt like language hybridization is ultimately where we're going, and so, um, for example, uh, one of my favorite clients brought me in to work on Java. I ended up saying, well, let's prototype this stuff in Python. And I was able to do it so much more quickly than they could put Java together that they ended up moving to Python. And then they decided, um, uh, after I had gone, and I talked to them just a year or two ago, they decided that they were going to try, try Go, but then eventually sort of backed away from that because that wasn't serving their needs. So they, I think they're still predominantly Python. Um, it's also not such a big deal to combine languages. For example, people uh, use Erlang for specific needs. Uh, makes a good controller for, uh, and it interacts with other languages easily. I have not yet created, I've, I've um, dabbled with the idea of creating an Erlang server and then talking to other things using it because it's so good at certain things. It's designed for certain things. So I think it's probably worth learning that. Of course, we've got REST JSON APIs. We've got we continue to move towards uh, web technologies as the UI for everything. And why not? Uh, we that's that's where most of the development has. Um, one of the other things that I've been finding interesting is the Herd project in the, uh, that's part of GNU. And one of the things that they have tried to set up their operating system is that it's easy to to write in whatever language you want. And I think, oh, that's interesting at the operating system level to do that. Um, so uh, I'm going to say that arguing to consider new languages is no longer part of my mission. We're not really stuck there anymore. I don't have to say, hey, you should l use a different language for this part of your project. And you're not going to say, oh my gosh, that's a crazy idea. Um, nobody does that anymore because using HTML5 and JavaScript and CSS is, is so common anymore. Um, also, it used to be one of the big problems with trying languages was 
buying a new language was a very expensive process, bringing it in, et cetera. Now we can just experiment. Pretty much they're all open source projects. So, um, so they kind of don't matter. We can move on to the next bottleneck, which is process and human, human interaction, which we've kind of been struggling with for a while, ever since the beginning of the Agile movement. And if you don't remember them, these are the four preferences of the Agile movement. Uh, nice, they're, they're nice ideas. Um, they're, I, I like the Agile stuff a lot, but what, what happened to it? The ideas are good. The problem was the delivery mechanism. It, it got infected with the usual industrial age stuff that we apply to it. The changes weren't fundamental enough. They were saying, okay, so you have some problems here. They have to do with human communication. We'll have you communicate with a customer. You'll have you communicating with management better. But uh, I might argue with my investigations into reinventing business, I might argue that the deeper problem is that the way that we're structured in the first place may have polluted this otherwise good set of ideas. Um, also, I understand why we ended up with, so th for those of you who didn't experience it, before Agile, <clears throat> we had this battle over object-oriented design methodologies. And people started smelling blood in the water. And they said, there's profit to be made here. So they were making up new object-oriented design methodologies. And believe it or not, there were battles at conferences over whether we use boxes or clouds to represent objects. Okay. And so what the Agile folks wanted to do was to steer away from that happening with this. And so that's why they came up with this idea of the, the four basic concepts and to say, OK, look, if you fit into that, then you're Agile. You don't have to get into wars about it. You, you could call yourself Agile. And that's OK. But eventually, um, I think eventually what happened, and what happens to a lot of the IT innovations, because I've seen these things happen before. Uh, the first one was they called it the, um, the, I don't know if they called it AI revolution or the AI. Anyway, there was this, for a few years, there's, there was this big thing about AI. And this was back in the, I don't know if it was in the 90s. I think it must have been in the 90s. Anyway, AI was going to be this big thing. And then, and then we had to back off to expert systems. But there was a lot of investment, a lot of enthusiasm, this and that. And then um, people moved in, and they saw the ability to make money from that enthusiasm. And they started doing that. And eventually, it kind of diluted it. And so that's what I think happens if you have any early success. You, you, you end up with these delivery companies, and they produce optimized delivery systems, which is uh, often training companies or consulting or whatever. It doesn't require a lot of thinking, so we can hire, hire people off the street, give them some quick training, and then start making money off of them. Um, the people who are innovators get tired of this, and they leave. And we're left with these people who will come in, and they'll say, OK, here's the problem. Everything you're doing is wrong. Stop doing that and do it my way. And then they leave, and you just continue doing it the way you were doing it before. It's not, not really consulting. That's why I put consult, consultants in uh, quotes. OK. Anyway, so we're still kind of working on the people issues of Agile and struggling with that. And moving forward in some ways, we'll, that, that battle will be ongoing. So we're, we're still a lot in the middle of arguing about um, what Agile is and why we need it, et cetera. Um, but before we, we start uh, going down the curve and feel like, OK, we're getting better at this, uh, I'm, I started asking the question, well, OK, what happens next if we have more or less solved, even though more languages are coming out and we're still experimenting with them, it's not a point of argument. Um, <clears throat> I would say 
we're moving away from it being a point of argument that we need better processes and systems for interacting with each other and customers and management, et cetera. Um, we, we're, m many people have accepted that and have moved away from a uh, waterfall mode of doing things and a more uh, interactive uh, approach. So now I'm starting to ask, well, OK, what's, what's going to happen next? How can we improve things next? And I think it has to do with getting better ideas about what to build. And um, so ultimately, what I want to do, the reinventing business project, is about re-architecting the organization from the ground up. To, but one of the things that I think that does is it produces better ideas. It turns out that the hierarchical organization is designed to do the same thing over and over again. It was, it was built during the industrial age, and the goal there was to build widgets and to build the same widget over and over again. And so you come in with changes or new ideas, and the organization is designed to stifle those. So we have people saying, oh, we need new innovation, but they're in this hierarchical st structure that's designed to prevent that, that very innovation. And they, they know, people in that organization know, wow, if we don't innovate, we're going to die. Organizations do die. In fact, they're dying faster than ever. The average lifespan of a corporation was maybe, I forget what it was, 60 or 70 years, and now it's below 50 and falling. So those organizations, big ones, I mean Kodak, who would imagine Kodak would close their doors? And you can imagine other ones going away. And that is because they can't innovate because the structure prevents them from innovating. So ultimately, I think we need to um, change the, the very nature of the organization to produce better ideas. But here, I'll look at, OK, existing organizations if you want to try and produce better ideas. How we don't get ideas is to use the industrial age hierarchies or to, to work within them. You almost have to work around the industrial age hierarchy. And um, this is a big thing. What you get when you have a hierarchy is the people who, who are higher up in the hierarchy, they want to be in control, and they want to take from the organization. That's why uh, the CEO makes hundreds of times more than the person in the, you know, the line workers, so, which is ridiculous if you think about it. That person does not contribute that much to the organization. And so uh, it's crazy. But they're there because they want to be. They got their MBA because that's what they want to do. All right, that doesn't produce good ideas, though. That's, that's a totally different thing. Another thing that doesn't produce I good ideas is consensus. I, for several years, I lived in what's called a co-housing community. And they did everything based on consensus. So uh, effectively, we all had to agree on anything that we did. And that was a, it was a painful but a very good experience for me because I realized Wow, with consensus, the decision-making process is long and horrible. And once you make a decision, which is virtually always subpar, it's always going to be the l far below uh, even moderately good decision. Once you make that decision, because the process was so painful, you never want to revisit again. That is done forever. OK, that's not a good way to experiment. And what we're talking about here, when you're getting ideas, you have to be able to experiment. It has to be very light and easy. So um, consensus is the antithesis of that. Even though it sounds like, well, we're all in agreement, so that's a good thing. Well, we're all in agreement on a subpar idea, and we won't touch it again. So that's not a good thing when you want to experiment. Um, the other thing is that the ownership of the decision is diluted. So it means, well, we all agreed on this, so we're all equally responsible. Nobody owns the decision. Nobody can change it or uh, you know, step forward. And anyway, it it's sounds good, and a lot of people go to it because what they want is everybody to be in agreement. But it turns out everybody being in agreement isn't that great of a thing. So ideas have to have a space that supports lots of rapid experiments and failure. Got to have failure. 
If you're not failing a good portion of your time, you're not pushing the boundaries enough. So um, one of the things that I'm looking at is techniques to trick you out of your normal modes of thinking. Because if you just go to your normal mode of thinking, you'll do the same thing over and over again. Uh, if we're trying to get ideas, doing the same thing over again is not the goal. So there's two basic approaches. You can take old ideas and put them together in different ways. Or you can try and come up with completely different ideas. So one of the approaches that people have used is brainstorming. Brainstorming, turns out, was invented by, if I remember correctly, a marketing guy who just pulled it out of his pocket one day and said, oh, here's a, here's a word, brainstorming. Let's do this thing where we all shout ideas at each other and then we'll be mixing them up. And maybe it was a step forward from whatever was there before. I don't know. Um, because it was, I don't know, sometime in the 30s or whatever. But what we discover with brainstorming is that the ideas that come to the top are the ones that are produced by the loudest or most, most persuasive people. Just because they're loud or persuasive doesn't mean they come up with good ideas. It just means that they're loud and persuasive. Um, also, brainstorming tends to fixate you on one idea and to block out others. There's been some interesting recent studies and, and research on brainstorming. Um, it tends to inhibit creative thinking. Well, that's opposite of what we're trying to do. It also, people have discovered that judging does help. And one of the rules in brainstorming is that there's no judging. Well, it turns out judging helps us focus and move in particular directions. And they also discovered by doing experiments that Working on your own produces more, many more ideas than brainstorming does. So brainstorming tends to inhibit ideas. It's just, it, it, it was not created with any kind of research. It just, somebody came up with this idea and people go, brainstorming, it's like a storm of ideas. That sounds really good. We should do that. And for, you know, how many years? 80 years we've been doing it. All right. So what do we do instead of brainstorming? Well, someone, I don't know who, came up with the idea of what they called brain writing. And the goal of brain writing is to bring ideas from everybody, not just people who are loud or persuasive. Um, what you do is you use very small cards for a good reason, because you don't want people writing essays on this. You want to distill it down. The idea is one idea per card. You use one or two sentences to describe it. Don't write essays. Um, you spend 10 minutes capturing ideas from a group. So you're quietly, effectively, you're working on your own, coming up with ideas. And then there's a rule in brain writing, which is no guessing or confessing. And that means you're not supposed to guess who came up with an idea. And if you came up with an idea, you're not supposed to confess to it. You don't want to attach a person to an idea because that's going to bias people. So you want to focus on the idea, not the individuals. Um, so, um, so anyway, that's a technique that people have tried with a lot of uh, good success uh, in terms of collecting ideas. And I'll talk about a variation of that that Google uses, apparently, they say. Um, here's another approach, uh, improv. I've taken one or two improv workshops. They're very, well, at first you go, oh, I couldn't do improv. That's like acting without a script. Oh, no. No, I mean, I can't get, them, I can't get in front of people in the first place, and much less talk without knowing what I'm talking about. But a good improv coach will have you doing that. And then afterwards, you go, oh my gosh, I just did improv. It was so easy. It just happened. So if you, And there are people out there who are that good that can just draw out the most withdrawn person. Now, the workshop that I took, there was one person there who said she had come to that workshop maybe a dozen times or something, because this is when she could be herself. And the rest of the time, she was totally withdrawn. But she could do, she could come to this workshop and do improv. So it's that transformative to a lot of people's lives. I have a friend who started doing it and his writing, he, he had tried to be a screenwriter for many years. Uh, and now his writing has totally transformed. It was partly the improv, but it's done a lot of other things. So for example, there's an exercise, a well-known exercise that you do in improv called Yes And. So the idea is. I say, um, I've started a company 
that makes red plates. And you might have a story in your mind, you go, well, no, it's not red plates, it's sponges. And that's not how the game works. The game works and you go, red plates and blue sponges to clean the red plates. And then I say, yes, and we sell them to people who are colorblind. And you say, yes, and, you know, and you just go back and forth. And I, I did just make all that up just then. So, um, so it's possible. So, uh, th but the idea of the yes and is that by not stopping any ideas, you keep moving forward until you get to some weird place which has, you know, maybe you're saying, and we're making these visual wall things. And we make a holodeck out of it. We make a whole room full of them. And ceilings and floors. And we go into it and we do this thing and the game industry comes and they pay us a billion dollars for our idea. So, there you go. So anyway, that kind of, of thing is what a improv coach will get you doing. Mind mapping, I took a different workshop which was on writing. Uh, the teacher was, she had written a book called Writing the Natural Way and it used mind mapping. And that was fascinating because it got us to some really interesting writing almost instantly. It was a five day workshop and it was just, I don't know, it was amazing. So the way mind mapping works for writing anyway is that you start with a word or a phrase and you draw a circle around it and then it makes you think of something else. So it's a little improv like as well. And you write that word down and you draw a line to it and you draw a circle around it. My theory, nobody has any idea of why this works so well. My theory is that, okay, the right brain, left brain thing has been pretty much debunked, but something goes on between verbal and visual. So my thinking is that, well, drawing lines and circles, that's kind of a visual thing and then the words are verbal and it's kind of moving you back and forth between those two modes and in the process of the edge is maybe where the ideas come from. I'm ju I just made that up, not now, but I, I made that up, but that's kind of what I'm thinking is happening. You know, somehow it's by mixing the two, it causes more ideas to happen. So basically you just keep going. If you reach the end and you don't have any uh, inspiration, in this case, to start writing, then you go back to another branch and you you keep going. But usually what we found in this workshop was that we'd start, we'd do this, and then we get here and suddenly we're thinking about uh, turkey dinner on Thanksgiving and what happened or, and we're writing about it. And stuff, what's, what's fascinating is the things that will come up, sometimes memories that you haven't thought about forever and suddenly it's just right in the forefront of your head. And and you know the memory's back and you're writing about it or some other event or anyway. So um, mind mapping has, has been a very interesting thing. Uh, shifting is pretty useful. Get, an, get somebody else's perspective. Uh, there's a game called if I were a customer who wanted uh, to display my information to lots of people who were driving by, I would like to have a curved wall or, you know, anyway, you imagine yourself as a customer, you change your environment, you go outside, you take a walk, you try something really different. Okay, these, I didn't mention these, all of these images are paintings that I've done. So that's an experience that I, has, has really forced me to move out of my normal comfort zone because I've had to deal with, you know, what's, what looks good? Uh, what's, uh, does it have to look like a thing? Um, all these things that I had to struggle with, but in the process of struggling with it, it changed me so that I could think about things that I wasn't able to think about before. Meditation, daydreaming, taking a nap, moving physically, uh, try standing desks, try treadmills under standing desks, uh, all kinds of things. I have a friend who's a science fiction author. He's, um, he wrote a, a novel called The Wind-Up Girl. Some of you might have read it. So um, Paulo, he got one of these treadmills and he said, he said he knew it was a crapshoot, you know, a thousand bucks or whatever they cost. He says, never look back. It's been a wonderful thing. So all kinds of stuff can help you. Um, some people suggest thinking in reverse, like you, you, instead of solving the problem, create the problem. Or say, if we've got operations, 
how would we make the operations worse? Uh, how would we downgrade the product rather than upgrade it? Anyway, you, you have all these reverse things, and then you, you take the ideas that you come with to try and do these things and reverse them and see what that produces. So uh, I'm only touching the surface of some of the things that I've seen. I'm, I'm hoping to collect more and more better ideas. Um, so here's an example for decision making, and you'll recognize that this is similar to the uh, brain writing that I mentioned before. And Google apparently uses this. It's hard to know what Google actually uses. It. Maybe some, maybe a few groups in Google use this, but they claim that they use this. And they're wanting to do these things quickly to avoid groupthink. The idea is that, just like in brain writing, everybody writes down as many ideas as they can, quietly, for a few minutes. Um, two minutes, you review your own ideas. You choose one or two out of those. So you, you do an initial filtering process. And then you share your ideas just quickly. You're not selling them. Um, somebody writes these on a board. And then um, for five minutes, each person quietly writes down their favorite idea from the board. So you've got collecting these ideas. You're saying, oh, I like this one and this one. And then people state their vote. Sometimes they make an argument for why they like this idea. Um, and then you use a thing called dot voting. So you just put dots next to the ones that people like. Then you have a decider. OK, this is where it gets a little weird. Because the decider, doesn't matter who it is, the decider independently decides on which is the best idea. And they can respect the dots or not. Doesn't matter. OK, and you're thinking, well, but then you're not you know, doing all these things to get the best idea. Well, if you're thinking that your process must produce the best idea, which is the way traditional management has, thinks about these things, it's like, well, we must have the best idea so that we're doing the right thing and moving forward and guaranteeing success. But if you look at experimentally, well, you don't know what's going to work. So it's better to quickly choose something, then go try it out, and then, if it's not working or it seems suboptimal or whatever, you come back and you revisit this process. So the speed is actually more important than the correctness. You, you have to assume, well, there is no such thing as correct. So let's just choose an idea that feels roughly right and do this process quickly enough that we can move forward. And, and so this narrows it down, um, but it has this arbitrary factor to it, which is fine. That's OK. Uh, and in fact, that leads us to the, the furthest out idea, which is based on this book, Reinventing Organizations. Reinventing Organizations is talking about different historical modes of putting organizations together. This is, of all the research I've done, this is the most mind-changing book that I have read in terms of how can, what organizations can look like. So <clears throat> there are three fundamental ideas in reinventing organizations. And uh, in, the, in the teal organization, he, calls it, he gives colors to the organizations. The first one is self-management. The second is wholeness, which means bringing all of yourself to work. And that doesn't, I, I was having a conversation right before Edward picked me up with, with Guido van Rossum, the creator of the language. We spent an hour or so together. And I was explaining this to him. He goes, he goes, oh, I don't want to bring all myself to work. Then I'm at work all the time. I go, no, I didn't, I didn't mean that it's more hours of you. It doesn't, doesn't mean as many hours of you at work as possible. No, that's totally the opposite of what this tries to do. It means that when you're at work, the whole you is at work. So if you, and the example that they give is you know, maybe the way you decorate your space, or what you wear or uh, any number of things. But it's like, we don't want just the part of you that turns, that makes the, the, the cogs. Uh, we want all of you at work. And that's a little harder to put your finger on. I did take a workshop just recently where what we did, well, a, a lot of this is a, an organization. They have restaurants. They're called um, uh, Cafe Gratitude. And basically, they started by. Everybody, before they start their work shift, they pair up with somebody else who's starting their work shift. And they do this process called clearing, which has nothing to do with Scientology. It's uh, basically 
uh, you, there are two questions, and the first one is sometimes I call it the shadow question. It's like basically what's bugging you, and the second question is what are you something to do? What are you grateful for? Um, I ended up creating an app <coughs> for them, so um, which w walks you through those questions. And the idea is that you're bringing all this stuff to work anyway, um, whatever's bugging you at home or the rest of your life, and so this kind of clears that out. Um, doesn't like get rid of it, but it kind of brings it into the moment, and that's the kind of thing that he's talking about. Uh, I believe that uh, Frederick Lulu is talking about in reinventing organizations. The third fundamental concept is called evolutionary purpose, and it means that the organization, instead of having the captain saying, "We're going to go this way," and it's I'm smarter than anybody, and so I know that this is what the organization is going to do, which is the way industrial age organizations work. The uh, evolutionary purpose says, "What we try, the organization is an entity that wants to go someplace, and as part of it, we try and figure out what that is. We listen to it, and we try and understand where does the organization want to go. So it's it's all kind of it's a little weird to think about. It's all kind of touchy-feely. It's kind, of, and yet the organizations that have done it this way, and this wasn't like they read his book and said we're going to do it this way. They created this themselves. Have been really successful. So they're out there. Of course, Wall Street doesn't really talk about them because it's too weird for them. But they're there and they're quite successful. And um, anyway, this is what I'm interested in. But one of <clears throat> so as part of the self-organization process. Anyone in the organization can make a decision, including a decision that costs the company money, which is like, whoa, that's different. But they have to go through what's called the advice process. And the advice process says that you have to consult with somebody who knows more about the topic than you do, who's researched it, or some, somebody or some group of people. And you have to consult with the people who are going to be affected by the decision. So you have to do that. Now, once you do that, you can, and they might, both of them might go, oh, no, don't do that. Um, you can still go ahead and make that decision. And he gives examples of people who have done that. Um, and what, notice that what this allows, this is, this is a different way of allowing experimentation within a company. Because it, it means that, well, you don't have to be in the company for many years and work yourself up to a senior level before you can start making some of these experimental decisions. By the time you get up to the senior level, you're, you've got all these filters that prevent you from doing those stupid crazy things, right, that might, uh, who knows, might not work. Um, so that means that somebody young who comes in and has wild and crazy ideas can try them out. And that's the kind of thing that causes innovation within a company, not filtering them until only the more senior level people can, can try experiments. So, so this is really important, but it's also very different from anything. This is one of the things that I like about this book. I go, I couldn't have thought of that on my own. Um, so this is way out on the edge. And uh, most traditional organizations are not ready to think about this. We're still on the leading edge of this whole teal organization thing. But one of the things that why this appeals to me so much is that I've been through this process a couple of times before. By this process, I mean. Uh, thinking about a problem in a certain way, hunting around, and eventually finding a system that I couldn't have thought of myself and works way better than anything I tried to think of. So uh, back at, when the internet was just starting to appear, I could see the effect. I had been involved with organizing conferences. There was one called the Software Development Conference in particular that I had created both the C++ and the Java tracks for. So I had been involved with these. These conferences made tons of money on their show floor. In fact, that's where they made most of their money. And the actual technical part of the conference where you had speakers and everything, that was, from their standpoint, that was almost like, well, we have to do that to legitimize the conference so that we can have the trade show and charge a ton of money. Well, the internet was coming along, and I could see, well, if you can just put your stuff up on the web, why would you take, I mean, it was incredibly expensive not just to, to get the temporary real estate and put up the booth, but you had to bring technical people who were normally doing line, you know, actual work on your products. You had to take them out and bring them to the conference and have them answer questions. It was, it was a, 
it worked because it was the only thing that was possible, but it was really a terrible and expensive idea. And the conference couldn't let go of this. And that's why that particular conference augured into the ground a few years ago. It's because they just, their whole model, they were stuck in the hierarchy, so they couldn't change. And their whole model was based on, well, we make most of our money on the trade show, so we could never give up the trade show. I remember when I suggested it to them. And they go, they were horrified. That was, that was the worst idea they could ever hear. So instead, they went out of business. So I started thinking, well, now that we have the internet, it seems like a lot of these things that we had to do through the traditional way, we could do them using the internet. And I, those of you who are old enough, remember that when we first came up with computers, there was people started, started thinking about computer-based learning. And what they did was they took flashcards and they put them on the computer. And, you know, of course, very, no, no creativity at all. They just automated flashcards, all right? Well, I sort of was doing this with the idea of a conference. I was going, oh, well, we can just, you know, organize the conference based on the computer instead of on paper. We can market the, the conference on the, on the internet. Okay, that, you know, that, but it was the same conference. And <clears throat> I, fortunately, I started talking to people about this and just bouncing ideas off them, saying there should be a different way to do a conference. Finally, I talked to, I, I, I've known Martin Fowler for a number of years. I, meant, I mentioned this to Martin Fowler. And he said words which I've tried to make uh, part of my way of thinking. He said, let's do an experiment. And so we started doing experiments. And in fact, that's what Edward came to, was when, had we, were we doing open spaces by the time you showed up? OK. Well, before open spaces, we tried a bunch of different things. And they usually involved the whole group being in a room together. And there was nothing going on except what was in that room. And so what we, most of these people were speakers and writers and things. And so when one person kind of got the talking stick, they would often not let go. And there was one event where we had a person who liked to talk. He, he was sort of a, someone who told bar stories and things like that. And he would turn everything into a story. And it would go on and on. And it had nothing to do with whatever we were doing. And there was a fellow who, at the other end of the table, he was actually hitting his head against the table, not configuratively, literally banging his head against the table when this person started to talk again. And that didn't change his behavior at all. He kept talking. And I mean, he, anyway, it was, it was, so obviously that wasn't the way to do things. So eventually, through numbers of different experiments, we discovered open spaces. Martin discovered open spaces. And when it started working, it worked so well, and it was so revolutionary that I just, I, I started thinking, well, are there other things that maybe we're just not thinking about the right way? Are there other things that we can do this way? So in the meantime, um, I continued doing the conferences. We made the Java Posse Roundup. This is from the Scala Summit that we just had. I mean, not the Scala Summit, the Winter Tech Forum that we just had, and the Scala Summit's going on. These take place in my town of Crested Butte, Colorado, which is um, at 9,000 feet up in the Rocky Mountains and beautiful. So that's part of what got me started. Um, so we'll take questions and answers. If you have uh, suggestions for generating ideas, please send them to that email address. And other than that, I'm done. <laughs>